Um, a good afternoon from Berlin and welcome to this webinar with the intriguing title, Cyber Military Transformation, Why So Slow? Uh, my name is Franz Stefangadi and I'm a fellow with the Cyberspace and Future Conflict Program here at the IISS Europe office in Berlin, where my research primarily focuses on modern and uh, future war fighting. I have two great panelists here with me online that I would like to briefly introduce to you. First, um, we have Dr. Max Smith, a senior researcher at the Center for Security Studies at ETH Zurich and director of the European Cyber Conflict Research Initiative. He's the author of No Shortcomings, Why States Struggle to Develop a Military Cyber Force, which will be the main topic uh, of discussion in this webinar today. Then I'm happy to present Dr. Jason Blessing, a Jean uh, Kirkpatrick visiting research fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on cybersecurity, military cyber forces, military technological transformation, and force structure, as well as US cyber defense policy. He also is one of the leading brains behind our new cyber methodology uh, for our military balance uh, database here at w, uh, IISS. Um, the third speaker, Dr. Greg Austin, unfortunately um, has uh, taken ill and will not be able to join us during this webinar. So it will just be the three of us. Um, Max will uh, kick off this discussion. He'll speak for about uh, 15 to 20 minutes, followed by Jason. Then I might have a couple of questions uh, and then I will open it up uh, to uh, the general audience. Um, just a note on um, how you can uh, ask your questions. Uh, please uh, type your questions in the chat box function um, and um, I'll make sure that they get thrown into the discussion and um, please um, send us the question whenever you feel like it. I'm going to start collecting them um, um, over the course of this webinar and um, I will try to get to all of your questions uh, by the end of it. We'll be <clears throat> uh, going on for about uh, 90 minutes. Uh, I'm really looking forward to a, a fruitful and interesting discussion. And um, without further ado, let me hand it over now to our uh, first panelist, uh, Max, who will talk about his really, really interesting new book that he wrote. Max, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Franz. Yes, yeah, so the book, No Shortcuts, uh, Why States Struggle to Develop a Military Cyber Force, starts off with um, two observations. And the first observation is um, the following. What we have seen over the past two decades, and particularly the last decade, is a institutionalization of military cyber efforts. Not only have countries published different cyber strategies and cyber defense strategies, but now a growing number of countries have, of course, also set up cyber commands or similar branches or services uh, within their military forces. Many of these cyber commands have a mandate to conduct offensive cyber operations and specifically cyber effect operations. Cyber effect operations are those operations with this aim to disrupt, deny, degrade, and or destroy. Now, whilst we have seen this development over the past decade, what we've also seen is in so to say non-development, which is the actually relatively few number of countries that have actually conducted cyber effect operations. Um, and so it's not that we haven't seen any cyber effect operations at all, but the ones that we do see tend to be attributed to a really small and select group of states. So the question is, what explains this gap? Now, when you look at existing policy discussions or academic research, a number of different explanations have come up, right? One of the most obvious ones is that cyber operations are simply lousy, coercive tools. They have limited signaling nature. You can't showcase them easily. And as a result of that, they don't really help in the kind of creating certain costs of benefits, a cost for the defender uh, or benefits for the attacker. Another argument that frequently comes up is, well, actually, we should not think too much about these effect operations and particularly the high level ones. What this space is about is it's really much more an intelligence contest and the primary uh, activity we see are espionage operations. 
And one connected argument that I've made myself together with Richard Hognett is, yeah, activity below the threshold on the tech can cumulatively still be strategically meaningful. So the argument here is, well, we don't need them. There are two other ones that I wanted to point out here. One is, well, you know, we haven't seen them. Um, for instance, an argument that John Lindsay has made because cross-domain deterrence works at this higher level. When it comes to cyber effect operations, that's where you know you might be able to respond also with other means outside of cyber. And as a result of st that, uh, states have refrained from doing so. Lastly, is that, well, we haven't seen these cyber effect operations because particularly in the West, there is this norm against usage. There are normative constraints that avoid states from actually deploying these capabilities. What I'm doing in this book is not to argue directly against these statements, but to say, well, but this all depends on a key assumption. And that is that states have crossed the barriers for entry and actually have the option to operate in this space in the first place. But we should actually ask the prerequisite question, and that is, can state actually develop and operationalize uh, an offensive cyber capacity? And as the title of my book suggests, um, you know, military struggle to do so. And so the, that's the kind of the main argument, and I show that the time and resources required are much higher than are often appreciated. Now, the way that I've set up the book is through a number of different parts. The first one very much delves into questions around definitions of what are effect operations, how do they link with intelligence operations, how can we collect data in this space, and what do we exactly know of institutional establishment across the world, what is public, what may be not, what may, what might be missed uh, in the kind of public realm that is also still going on. And what I'm doing in the book after is to explain that the constraints of actors differ and that influences their cyber operations. And I will get to that in a second. Then I develop a framework for capacity development and then show how this changes over time and how external actors can influence it. I don't have time to go through all of these different steps here, but for you know, the amount of time that I have in this, uh, for these opening remarks, I thought I'll point out to a couple of different things and highlight them. The first one is this element about what you can say, this is an uneven playing field. When we wanna look at the barriers of entry, we have to recognize that these are different for different states. And why is that? Well, it's very much reminds me myself and what I wrote in the book, about um, a statement that uh, someone made at the first US Cyber Command Symposium held on the Chatham House rule, where the person rather frustratedly drew a big um, box uh, on uh, like a semi um, real one um, uh, on, on a whiteboard. And he said, you know, this box is all the activity that you can do in cyberspace. And then the person drew another tiny smaller box and this is the type of activity that we are allowed to do. And it kind of gets to a point that indeed there are certain actors more constrained than others. Now the key point here is, it's not that there are differences in constraints, but that this unlevel playing field completely changes the resources required to conduct operations. So depending on the organizational, strategic and operational uh, constraints, the, the, the amount of effort that's needed to conduct an operation changes radically. And in the book, I discuss a couple of different ones. And it starts from the targeting process. So very opportunistic, unconstrained actors can often start with simply, I have this tool available to me, or I can get access to it, against which systems can I use it? So it's much more kind of tool-centric or capability-centric, and then see what targets are available. But for the more constrained actors, it's often the other way around. I want to gain access to this target and achieve a specific effect. How can I go about it? The question as a result of it changes and also changes the way in which you want to plan it. Now, of course, there are many other things that change, but one that is absolutely crucial is actually in the testing part. So what you see with some of the most advanced operations by constrained actors is that the cost of an operation at the time is not so much in the actual deployment, but it's in the whole process before and making sure that, you're, that the capability is actually doing what you're supposed to want it to do. Um, and that's often kind of forgotten. Now, the way in which I kind of systemize capability development process in my book is through a number of different um, uh, elements. And I call this the PATIO framework, where I talk about the people that are required, the 
exploits, tooling, infrastructure, and organization. And a key part here is that whilst we sometimes you will hear that cyber weapons can be sold or countries can develop a cyber arsenal of weapons, really capability development is of course primarily about people and not just your technical um, people such as your operators, your developers, your system administrators, your vulnerability analysts, but also a wide set of other uh, workforce requirements from, of course, your strategists to your legal experts to your consultants to maybe some front office people. So it's a much wider group. Um, two additional points. The first one is the link here between your capability development and your and a state strategic posture. What is, and that's often overlooked, if cyber capability development is primarily about people, although there are these other elements, what is absolutely crucial is the retention, recruitment, and training of your workforce. Doing that is easier for some cyber commands than others. Now, why is that the case? There are a few cyber commands in this space where the cyber command has a what we call peacetime mission. We're actually in peacetime. They're not just allowed to do reconnaissance, but maybe even achieve effect operations. U.S. Cyber Command, as an example, really stands out here. Yet the majority of cyber commands that exist don't have this mission. That mission they have is only for wartime. In peace, they're not just even not allowed to do effect operations, but often not even allowed to do reconnaissance. That's in the realm for the intelligence agencies. Now, whilst this might be a good setup, you don't want to maybe have your military always evolve in peacetime. You can see that this links back to their issues of retaining, training, and recruiting um, people. Because the question then is, in very basic terms, what do these people do than if maybe once every five years, you may get a mandate to conduct a cyber effect operation during wartime? In the period before, how are you going to fill up the space? How are you going to make sure that these people know what they have to do and find the job interesting enough to, for instance, not move to the private sector where talent is also so uh, important and needed. Last point is about the type of actors. So I've mentioned um, this uneven playing field. Now we can take this to another step. If you agree that states are constrained in different ways and that, that influences their requirements, we can basically create a two by two, which is which type of states are more constrained and less constrained, and which type of states have more or less resources to overcome that. Now, when you look at the space, the argument that I'm making in the book is that the greater majority of countries that have established a cyber command are highly constrained, particularly those in continental Europe, and actually have invested very few resources to overcome them. We're talking about budgets between five and sometimes 15, 20 million. Far not enough to really do your training and operational development. If you look at the other two categories, um, the highly constrained, but also high resources, that's clearly one where the US certainly fitted in until 2018. After that, you've seen some reductions in the constraints that they had at a variety of different levels and a variety of different ways, but this is the kind of box that I would put them in. In the box of low constraints and high, uh, oh, sorry, um, uh, low resources, but also limited constraints. That's like North Korean early activity. And lastly, if you think about low constraints, but high resources, I guess the most dangerous actors in this space, the most obvious example would be Russia, where we have seen a decade long, at least history of really aggressive effect operations with consequences often far beyond the target that they were initially going after. Um, causing uh, significant damage um, across the world. I'm thinking about a case like NotPetya. And of course, we've also seen cases where they either successfully or unsuccessfully targeted significant uh, critical infrastructure with, of course, a number of prominent cases in Ukraine before the invasion. Think about Black Energy, where twice um, um, uh, Russia um, uh, um, took down, uh, partially took down the power grid in Ukraine, and also think about a field operation where we know that they tried to gain access to a chlorine station to potentially achieve an effect 
um, there as well with who knows what kind of consequences. I'll leave it there and then I'll take uh, any questions from Jason, from you, Franz, or anyone after. Thank you very much, Max. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation and great, great first round of uh, 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 remarks here. I, I um, definitely take immediately with me um, the statement that uh, capability development is primarily about people. I think that sometimes uh, in the debate uh, that's overtly too focused on technological capabilities, uh, so an aspect that's very often perhaps uh, forgotten, but very much applicable to not just the cyber dimension, but other dimension in the military dimensions in the military competition. Um, let me uh, turn the floor now, uh, hand over the floor now to uh, Jason to offer uh, some initial remarks and a uh, couple of uh, responses perhaps to what uh, Max uh, just said in his introduction. Uh, Jason, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, Max, uh, I'm really looking forward to your book getting released here in the US. Uh, and many of the concerns that you you lay out uh, in terms of uh, maturity development and capability development, organizational development. There are a lot of the same motivations underlying a paper I wrote with uh, Dr. Greg Alton for the IISS uh, assessing military cyber maturity uh, with a subtitle like every other paper has. Uh, but the, the point of that paper, you know, similar, but in a slightly different vein is uh, the purpose of our paper was to look at these, the, the political push and pull uh, and something that you allude to, and I know that is in some of your other work, is that uh, a lot of these developments in terms of maturity, it's not a linear process. Uh, and it's, it's messy. And so Greg and I tried to unpack this in our paper uh, a little bit. Uh, you know, it's on one hand, uh, with a lot of the frameworks that are out there in terms of organizational development, uh, much of it hasn't been applied to the cyberspace yet in terms of uh, what military intelligence are doing. Uh, but also part of the purpose of us writing this was to, to kind of give a, a shorthand tool to reformers, which, you know, when you talk about people, Max, uh, and the development of people, you know, these things don't happen on their own. They need reformers and champions to actually push through and get changes to take hold. Uh, so when we took a little bit of a, a, a broader view of maturity, uh, a sort of a, a larger conceptual uh, approach, and we broke military cyber maturity down into uh, really three different dimensions. Uh, strategic maturity, so talking about the degree to which you know, organizations, militaries, and their leaders have concrete plans for using independently and integrating uh, cyber effects uh, in these operations uh, in actual theaters towards national security ends, uh, and how they're going to actually be implemented on the battlefield, uh, whether digital or kinetic. Uh, institutional maturity is sort of the second conceptual bucket we look at. And as you mentioned, Max, you know, there are all sorts of barriers, but, you know, it's really about the, in our view, the degree to which you've harmonized your planning, your force preparedness, your execution, uh, you know, do you have those bureaucratic structures in place? Uh, and then finally, more explicitly, the capability development. And I, you know, that's not just the technical elements uh, and, you know, digital weaponry, what have you, but it's really about human skill, retaining those, and you know, making sure that uh, your your personnel uh, and your recruiting standards are in line with strategic intent and organizational demands. Uh, so those are those are really the, the three ways that uh, we try and think about maturity. And you know, it's you can make progress along one dimension uh, without making progress on the other on another dimension. And in many cases, progress in one dimension can actually impair progress along another dimension. Uh, so without going too far into the weeds of uh, our analysis, Greg and I advanced this impact matrix to understand the, the push and pull, like I said, of about seven different variables across these three uh, levels of maturity or these three categories of maturity. Uh, and you know, to, to keep it brief, I'll just uh, list off uh, the, some of the variables that we talk about and then some of the main takeaways. Uh, we look at four governance factors, so sort of four broad political uh, spectrum factors that can influence maturity processes in states and the military. Uh, the first is senior political leadership receptivity. You know, if, if you don't have leaders in place that are open to you know, hearing the good word about cyber, uh, it's going to be pretty hard uh, to actually get anything implemented. Uh, so that is, you know, that's a, a non-cost barrier, that's a political barrier that has to be overcome. And you need continuity in that leadership. Uh, and so leadership can push both ways, obviously. 
Uh, second is civil military relations uh, over conducting cyber operations. Uh, in particular, not just the, the degree of con civilian control over you know, delegation of operations, uh, but also the relationship to civilian cyber intelligence agencies and how those operations may overlap, conflict, or coordinate. Uh, so those are two, you know, uh, two dimensions of civilian military relationships uh, that we point to that has a big effect on where maturity goes. Uh, sort of two broader governance factors that we also assess is uh, ongoing military modernization initiatives, uh, and particularly the timing of those, uh, and you know whether earlier or later on in modernization initiatives uh, provide certain windows uh, for implementing changes uh, for cyber forces for building out cyber forces in the first place. Uh, and then finally, we look at the effects of alliances and international partnerships that can, in many cases, lower the cost, uh, but also have their own drawbacks in terms of what can actually be shared. Uh, we also look at three more proximate factors in terms of uh, military organizational variables. Uh, and we really, there are a lot that we could have included here, but we boil it down to three. Uh, one of the most important of which is operational experience, actual hands-on experience in the cyber domain, conducting or your own or countering uh, other offensive operations. Uh, you can draw all sorts of lessons uh, from your own operational experience, some which may fit into organizational biases, uh, some which may be validated by third parties, uh, but operational experience, there's almost no substitute. Uh, for military maturity. Uh, we also look at the overall adaptive capacity of military, which is you know, a little bit of an amorphous, amorphous concept, but it's to what degree can you actually absorb lessons, absorb new ideas, uh, and you have the expendable resources and political capital within the military uh, to actually incorporate new ideas about uh, cyber operations or the role of cyber capabilities uh, in war fighting, both alone and integrated with other kinetic capabilities. Uh, and then finally, the one that you can't overlook when you're talking about militaries is divergent organizational cultures. Uh, in the end, these tend to present more barriers to maturity across all three categories uh, than they do with aiding. But there are some cases, uh, and one of the cases that we looked at in particular was uh, the case of the Israeli Defense Forces uh, and how there's a culture of experimentation that actually does enable uh, capability and strategic maturity to a degree. Uh, so, you know, usually organizational culture prevents, uh, prevents barriers, uh, but there are times when it can actually promote ma maturity efforts. Uh, so we, we flush these relationships out and, you know, none of these variables, it's a, not a one-to-one -one analysis. It's not, you know, you take a step in political leadership, put you 10 points towards greater maturity. Uh, these variables are in conflict. Uh, each of the factors can facilitate or inhibit maturation depending on the context, but all of them are interdependent. And so you need to, you need to look at really the holistic picture uh, if you're going to try and implement you know, new organizational initiatives, if you're gonna try and uh, enhance what you already have in place in terms of cyber forces. Uh, and really a key ingredient to all of this is harnessing these political factors who are people, champions for change, people that you know, have the idea, have the vision, uh, and have the political capital and the connections to spend. Uh, otherwise, not much is going to get done. This doesn't happen on its own. Uh, you need these policy entrepreneurs to act as advocates for reforms, for political brokers, and more importantly, to act as translators between the policy communities the defense specific communities and the techie communities that actually have the hands-on experience uh, using the hardware and software. Uh, you need to be able to put all of these together and entrepreneurs and champions can do that by leveraging their expertise and their personal connections. Uh, those are two, uh, two elements that Greg and I found in some of our case studies that uh, you know, really illustrates that people are at the heart of this, as you said, Matt. Uh, so some key takeaways from our paper, uh, you know, Achieving greater military cyber maturity is not a given. Max, you, you, your book, you, you know, you really lay out that assumption and you really dissect that in your book. Uh, and you know, it's nice to know that our paper lines up with what your bigger project has been working on. Uh, there's, you know, there's no silver bullet to gaining greater military cyber maturity. 
Uh, implementation, again, is not a linear process. And the couple of cases that we lay out in the paper, we look at six different countries, uh, the US, China, Australia, uh, the UK, Estonia, and Israel. Uh, none of this is uh, a linear one-to-one -one process. There's no stage one, stage two, stage three. Uh, it's messy, convoluted, and a circular process with a lot of moving pieces. Uh, in, in that vein, because there are so many moving pieces, you know, resources and political capital are limited, uh, particularly for militaries that are still focused on building very basic and more robust conventional capabilities. Uh, and that speaks to your point, Max, that you know, one of the reasons why have we seen so many, you know, states try to develop and build out cyber forces, but only so few actually conducting uh, operations with effects. Uh, that's one of the reasons that we found is there's just a focus on the conventional capabilities. You know, even for more mature militaries, uh, very few are actually able to integrate cyber capabilities uh, with conventional capabilities. So not even on the, you know, in the operational context, but even in the strategic concept. Uh, and Franz, I know a lot of work that you've done on multi-domain operations uh, has focused on this as well. And it's, it, it's still a very young uh, intellectual area uh, in terms of how do we actually put the puzzle pieces together. Um, uh, finally, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the aspects that's underlying our paper that I, I'm working more on in my individual work is one of the things that we haven't really addressed is the, the relationship between the military forces and civilian cyber intelligence agencies that uh, primarily conduct signals intelligence uh, in cyberspace. Uh, defining their relationship to the military uh, is a, a necessary evil to a certain degree and a necessary aspect uh, to where and how maturity will play out for the armed forces. Uh, you know, it, it can be a great initial leg up to rely on the civilian signals intelligence agencies for capability, uh, access, et cetera. But in the long run, that can actually hamstring the independence and the ability of the military to mature on its own to conduct its own operations. Uh, and finally, nothing happens on its own. Uh, I, I've said this two or three times now, but you really need those people with the, in the circle, uh, the overlapping Venn diagram, these entrepreneurs at the right place that know the right people with the right skill sets, uh, they're absolutely crucial to getting anything done. And I'll stop there uh, and we can move to Q&A. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, and thank you, thank you particularly for highlighting one of our IISS uh, research papers that you and Greg uh, have been working on. It's a really excellent paper. I've had the chance uh, to read it a couple of weeks ago and I uh, highly recommend it also to the audience. Uh, you can find it on our IISS website. And um, well, um, I, was, I was struck by uh, the comments uh, of both uh, you and Max and there seems to be some synergy as you rightly uh, pointed out. And I do wanna give Max um, some uh, room here to respond to, or at least uh, to comment on what you just said, Jason. But I, I'm, I'm particularly again struck by this concept of uh, the importance of people here, not just at the technical level, but as you outlined, Jason, also when it comes to uh, cyber maturity at the political and policy level that you need these champions to move um, your cyber force into a certain direction. And of course, that to me, automatically poses the question in what kind of direction do we really want to develop in terms of uh, um, you know cyber capabilities or what's really the proper place um, for offensive cyber capabilities or um, a cyber force in um, overall military uh, force structure and that I think um, goes to a larger question that I've personally been pondering when we talk about, um, as you pointed out, I've done research on the subject um, over the last couple of months, multi-domain operations, all domain operations, and um, um, this new uh, war fighting concept that is being developed in the United States, but also among uh, NATO countries where cyber seems to be playing a central, central role. And it's still so ill-defined, particularly when it comes to cyber operations in wartime, actually, because a lot of what we've been talking about, and I found it very interesting, but what Max also said that in his opinion, I mean, a lot of it comes down to espionage operations or cyber operations below the threshold of um, um, armed conflict that is really shaping probably the operating environment in the lead up to the conflict, rather than playing really a crucial role once um, um, 
a conventional war, for example, as we are seeing right now, a couple of hundred kilometers to the east here of Berlin uh, in Ukraine is taking place. So um, let me let me perhaps um, hand it over to Max uh, for his response to what you just said, Jason, and then um, maybe Jason, you wanna you wanna um, um, also offer a few additional comments, and then we'll open it up to a general general uh, discussion. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the comments you made, Jason, and I really mean this, it's, it's music to my ears. I, I honestly, uh, perhaps it's, there is a selection of fact that we are now both on this panel that we both very much agree on the need to, first of all, look at capability development and at perhaps the highest level, as you do in the report, right, distinguish between strategy, institutions, and capability. And too often in common reporting, those are conflated. And we have used perhaps institutional development, this very you know, uh, obvious public indicator as a proxy for actually capabilities. Whilst we hopefully people start to increasingly realize that these two are sometimes connected, but very often um, they aren't and it requires a great deal of time to realign them. Um, what I think is interesting in the discussion and also how leaders think about cyber force development is to think about when many of the cyber commands were established. And what is interesting is that when we look particularly amongst NATO countries, of which you've also done much work, Jason, we saw that these establishments took place just after the financial crisis at a time of significant need, significant budget cuts, starting to think about it in 2010, 11, 12, established them a few years later. And there was this very much belief that yes, we may have to downsize our conventional military forces. We are also going to invest in a cyber command, in a command that uh, needs with fewer resources, but it still allows us to be at the forefront of modern war fighting um, for you know perhaps a couple of million we can still be able to uh, play a part in this uh, new day and age of war fighting and of course what we've increasingly seen is that hey that's not the case um, cyber uh, operations aren't necessarily cheap are certainly not always easy to integrate with your conventional operations and actually requires a great deal of training over the years to make sure that your workforce is up to speed and it requires an enormous amount of investment in infrastructure that quite frankly many organizations haven't done so today and i think to your point also franz as to where thought leaders should really come in it's in the end about you know being aware of the enormous capability requirements that are required in, in the first place uh, the willingness to say hey actually we don't have sufficient resources and we need to potentially change the setup and secondly is yeah indeed and it sounds very obvious connect that to a very clear strategy as to what you really want to achieve and one of the things kind of almost from an anthropological perspective that I noticed over the years going to different cyber commands and speaking to, to colonels, generals, or operators, is that sometimes the process of what you would normally expect is um, a multi-step process on how you're thinking about uh, operationalizing your military forces. That first starts from a strategic need, where you say, okay, we, we, we think there is this need to use cyber operations in these and these and these contexts, and then think, okay, how are we gonna achieve this? Well, we're gonna establish a cyber command with these type of people, with these type of capabilities to achieve that. And then you look further. However, what we have in reality seen is a slightly different process. Many of the cyber commands were established before there was quite honestly any idea on how they were actually going to operate and what they were actually going to do. So you got literally four or five years after the establishment of cyber commands, you've got internal workshops being set up of like, so, so what is actually a strategic posture here? You know, do, what, what, you know, how are we going to integrate this? Is this just for military? Are we doing just counter force capabilities at that time? Are they a supporting role? Hey, but you know, can we do some of these things that non-state actors are doing? Should we also do DDoS attacks? You've got this happening years and years after your initial establishment. Um, and it's just, again, there where, you know, of course, thought leadership will have to play a key role 
to ensure that these different elements are more closely aligned in the future. Yeah, Max, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you there in the sense that, you know, the, the point you're making is cyber does not exist independent of everything else. It's cyber strategy is subservient to larger military strategy. Uh, and that's, you know, I don't think we can belabor that point enough. And I, to France, to your point about, you know, you mentioned uh, what's happening in Ukraine. And Max, I'm really interested in your thoughts on this. Uh, but the role of one of the things I've been paying very close attention to is the role of larger strategy and how, you know, that has affected Russian operations and effectiveness uh, in terms of trying to integrate things, but also uh, how longer term strategy in the Ukrainian context has actually helped to lower the barriers uh, to operating. And so on the on the Russian side, for example, you know, the a lot of the effects that we've seen has been subservient to, particularly early on in the conflict, uh, the strategy and the assumptions that this would be a quick smash and grab, they'd be welcomed with open arms and sort of operating under the you break it, you buy it rules, right? You don't want to, you know, these operations are costly uh, and you don't want to sink all those resources in to disable critical infrastructure that you theoretically need to govern and rule over a population. Uh, so, you know, that's for me, that's been one big point of, OK, you think this is going to be a very quick invasion. Uh, you know, your cyber strategy is subservient to that. Right. It's going to dictate what you do with those capabilities. Uh, and, you know, to the also to one of the things that we look at in the paper with experience, I think what you've also seen, uh, uh, one of the reasons you've seen lack of an impact in addition to that strategy is the experience factor. Right. I think we've seen that uh, the Russian you know, across military and intelligence ecosystem, they're very good at espionage. And they're very good at exploitation, but they have the same problems that they have with kinetic forces, which is they struggle with combined arms operations. So it's no surprise that, again, organizationally and institutionally, cyber has to fit in with everything else. And if you're struggling with combined arms operations in the first place, it's cyber is not going to be the missing puzzle. Um, so those those are two big takeaways from the Russian side that I see that really echo your point, Max, that, you know, larger strategy makes a difference and what you do at top levels obviously trickles down. Uh, in terms of like thinking about, you know, the Ukraine, the development of Ukrainian capacity, and I, I had a, a conversation with Greg about this a few weeks ago, you know, uh, you would have expected that particularly uh, given the research that we've done, and, and Max, uh, again, this is where I'm interested in your input is, to what extent have we really seen the barriers been lowered for the Ukrainians, uh, almost out of necessity, but also out of a, a longer term strategy, right? On one hand, you know, part of their strategy has been learning from operational experiences of combating Russian attacks on the power grid, critical infrastructure, dating back to at least what Black Energy was 2015, I think. Uh, so, you know, at least back to 2015, uh, they've had these experiences and, you know, have been gaining the hands-on skills. Uh, you know, it seems to me that international partnerships uh, have absolutely helped disseminate skills and best practices uh, in terms of U.S. Cyber Command conducting hunt forward operations, uh, but also larger initiatives in terms of, you know, trying to meet NATO standards to some degree for military operating procedures. Uh, you know, in all these, the, the efforts that have been intertwined with the modernization efforts, uh, I'm, that's something that seems like it's lowered the cost a little bit, not just with the other militaries, right? The private sector, particularly in wartime, in terms of providing support uh, and backup bandwidth, et cetera, uh, it seems like that is and it can be an effective part of strategy to, in some cases, lower the short term barriers. Uh, and, you know, I don't think we need to focus too much to say it's, it's um, impressive the adaptive capacity the Ukrainian military has had, both in cyberspace and out of it. Uh, and clearly a senior leadership has buy-in. But Max, I'm, I'm interested to, to know what your takeaways from Ukraine is, given, given uh, you know, the, how larger strategy drives what you see on the ground, and in terms of some of the organizational barriers uh, and hurdles that the Ukrainians seem to have cleared, that would have, you, know, you would think it would have taken five to eight years to make some of the progress that they've made. Yeah, these are very, very interesting points, uh, Jason. I mean, on Ukraine, there are so many different aspects to analyze, right? Whether this is 
uh, one specific operation, but the role of maybe non-state actors and how they are or are not integrated, um, to what degree you know, data leaks have, are now really having an impact, all of those questions. But let me stick with kind of where you started with, which is the relationship between you know, the conventional capabilities and usage and, and cyber. Uh, in the book, I, I don't elaborate on it greatly, but I make a distinction between two different forms of interdependence uh, when it comes to using cyber operations alongside military operations. One is uh, what we call, what I call pooled interdependence, where you do cyber operations alongside conventional, but the effect of your cyber operation doesn't feed in directly into your conventional forces. So they kind of happen at the same time, which might be like things we have seen from Russia before. Even in Georgia, you can say when the tanks were rolling across the border, you saw some DDoS attacks that uh, were primarily targeting you know, media entities to cause some additional confusion at the time that this was taking place. Now, the value of pulled interdependence is that, yes, they kind of have to be interdependent and occur at the same time. But if one fails and doesn't achieve the effect you want, it is not a big deal. And if they don't exactly align, it's not a huge deal either. And I think much of what we have seen of Russia actually in Ukraine falls in that category. The second category is a in some ways, a, um, a more sophisticated one, although we can debate that, where clearly your cyber effect then enables the usage of more conventional forces. We've seen a, lot, a couple of those examples, of course, in this uh, space of electronic warfare, where you know um, Israel might take uh, out uh, uh, radar systems in Syria that then provides the opportunity for F-16s um, to go in that are not stealthy, to potentially uh, bomb an alleged uh, nuclear facility uh, that Syria um, had at the time. You know, and, and that one, you know, you need to be pretty sure about your effect, because if your effect is not achieved, you don't know, you know, uh, how this uh, it may have disastrous consequences actually um, sequ uh, subsequently. And again, there I can think about a few examples. Um, one thing that I think is quite one thing that I didn't realize before, and perhaps with the benefit of hindsight, you should have realized, is that operational activity of Russia before is obviously less resembling its current activity for a number of reasons. And the most important one is operational tempo. You know, if you look at some of the uh, previous operations that Russia conducted against Ukraine, the two, especially against the power grid, and especially the second operation, where they used pretty generic malware with a lot of what we call modularity, kind of plug and play solutions that you can, you know, can do different things when you want to. And that's what's caused so much concern in the US because they were like, whoa, we see this malware now, but hey, they could just as well use against certain critical infrastructure in the US. But these were quite what we call big tools. But then when you look at Ukraine, what Russia has been doing, and increasingly so, are these really small, what we call wipers, with just one functionality and one module that we have seen so many variants of. So uh, wipers for, uh, are, are malware that primarily seeks to uh, delete data, but it sometimes can also permanently encrypt. And so these are kind of data manipulation um, uh, types of malware. You know, we've seen an enormous iteration, like we're now, I don't know, beyond seven variants. That's an awful lot for anyone who's following this space. I can't think of seven previous malware variants that Russia has ever used before. So in terms of like, you know, operational, you know, speed, it's, it's incredible. But on that, yeah, they're very clear. We just want to burn one. We are aware that it quickly gets discovered and then we want to move on. And these are very kind of... Um, you know, if you look at them individually, you would say, well, this is not very sophisticated. But if you actually look at them, how they've developed them, you're like, oh, that's quite impressive how they have thought this through and are aware of the different requirements in wartime versus, versus peacetime. One on, on the Ukraine and, and, and partnerships and potentially learning. You mentioned, of course, the, the role of potentially NATO plays in this. And, you know, uh, the US, uh, Nakasona has now at least officially come out in two Sky News reports about hunt forward operations that ended on the day um, that the Ukraine conflict uh, started. Um, something that the US has been doing, of course, in other countries. And note, hunt forward here is 
about a specific set of operations, right? It's, it's collaborating uh, on a consent basis with another state to primarily collect malware samples uh, that can be used for, for analysis and potentially publicly uh, published. Not other things. What we still don't know is if the US has achieved effects against Russian operations during the invasion or uh, after uh, you know, February, uh, late February, whether they did that in partnership as well. That's a completely open question. And that's actually the more important one that no one has really addressed. But on those partnerships, whilst we talk about that, the key here is of course the private sector. And you know, but pr primarily what Microsoft has been doing. It's, uh, you know, it's a lot of Ukrainian officials that with Gmail accounts or other accounts, like two days in, into uh, the evasion, start like sending emails to Microsoft that they quickly have to verify who it is and like say, we need your help, please put this up. And you know, uh, and credit to Microsoft, right? We can be critical about maybe other things that, that they sometimes do or have done and how they, you know, their public relations work or whatever. But on this one, credit to them to actually have stepped up and said, okay, we're going to help. And we've put in like twice, like a hundred million in terms of infrastructure and, and, and resources with actually even certain human costs in that you almost see a burnout rate of some of their people who at the moment now, like three months in, is like, we can't continue to do this. And this leads to very open, like interesting questions where, you know, some other, some other companies didn't do that, didn't invest, invest as resources, and they didn't have to. There was no official requirements that they had to support Ukraine in doing this. But it does lead to questions further down the road. If we see this next, like, fingers crossed, we'll hopefully never see another invasion like this. But in case we do see what then the role is of these private sector actors and how much we should formalize this uh, in the future. Just one quick point to uh, one thing you said that uh, about operational tempo and the Russians, Max. One thing I've found pretty fascinating, and I know you've been following this, is uh, because of the operational tempo, and particularly uh, after you know after we've gotten more data with Hermetic Wiper, Wiper, and Caddy Wiper, et cetera, the that you're right. It's just it has been straight down the pipe Wiperware. Uh, unlike what the Russians have done previously with a longer time frame, where it masquerades as ransomware before encrypt, permanently encrypting or wiping the data. Uh, so I think that's a, you know, that's a fascinating sort of tactical element where operational tempo uh, is dictating the change in tools. So I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me also quickly jump here uh, into this discussion and uh, picking up on, on what both of you said uh, about Ukraine. Uh, I'm very glad that you highlighted the role of the private sector here, and I think that's going to be probably a crucial aspect in all future military operations, also where Western countries are going to be involved in the cyber realm, of course. Um, but I think um, just, and I don't want to really open up the Pandora's box here, but uh, talking about uh, deterrence or um, deterrence in cyberspace, uh, there was this uh, discussion in uh, the lead up and then also post post invasion of Ukraine that Russia is uh, acting more restrained in cyberspace because it fears retaliation uh, from the United States, the United States being the superior cyber actor, at least in the military realm. Um, that's also the judgment of one of our reports here, IISS, that we published uh, last year, where the United States is really the number one cyber military power for some uh, time to, to be. So I guess my question to both of you is, uh, to what degree do you think um, deterrence here has played a role rather than um, what uh, you described uh, in terms of uh, uh, actual Russian military capabilities have the Russians been deterred, do you think? Or was it really the case that um, some of those capabilities that we thought the Russians have, um, I think Jason, you briefly talked about, um, um, you know, the, the cyber arsenal essentially of Russia. Um, and then, you know, Max, you also briefly, briefly mentioned it here, you know, the operational pace and how quickly they really switch, um, um, you know, malware or, you know, like um, um, move on to, to a new set of, uh, you know, malware. Well, what are your thoughts on, on, on this discussion here? Um, Maybe Max, you first and then sure. Jason. Um, in brief, I don't buy the argument at all that, um, you know, deterrence um, was the reason why 
in Ukraine, we have seen limited cyber operational activity from Russia. Limited here, people are primarily then refer relative to certainly the big cyber war claims that perhaps some have made. Um, so that, that argument I don't buy, also considering all the other uh, things that, that Russia has done in Ukraine, of which you are much more well aware of than I am. But there is a question, okay, what is the reason that Russia at this given time has not conducted any cyber or significant cyber operations outside of Ukraine? And there, I don't know if deterrence is really the right word, but I could see also like there are limited benefits doing it right now, because why would you want to draw in the international community even further at this given point in time? I don't think you're perhaps so afraid of a retaliation in, in the cyber domain uh, where the US might, might punch back um, um, with, with cyber capabilities. But um, yeah, a more general question here uh, about, you know, you see these sanctions being ramped up. Why would we now draw more attention to, to ourselves, uh, to the international community? We can further weaken maybe public support um, um, uh, on our efforts. Um, that for me is the most obvious one. And that of course leads to another question is like, as we are um, putting more and more pressure on Russia, will they loosen up in the future and actually conduct cyber effect operations? And that's a really um, tough question. Um, the US has at least warned about it uh, through also their uh, Shields Up uh, initiative where um, um, DHS and, and also NSA uh, will say, you know, we have to be, Vigilant, it may happen. Um, the chances of uh, an attack occurring of this kind are clearly higher uh, than normally. And normally, um, we still have to be very considerate of it. Um, but I wouldn't dare to actually make any product predictions if they will or will not occur uh, in the in the months or, or year ahead. I largely agree with that, Max. Uh, you know, it, it depends on who's trying to deter what from Russia uh, and sort of the, the context of that question, right? And as you say, in Ukraine, uh, on the ground, that's a diff very different question than, okay, the rest of the West, the United States, why haven't we seen any of this? Uh, and I mean, cards on the table, I am largely a skeptic of deterrence in and through cyberspace. You know, I think there's more merit, uh, as you have said, Max, uh, in having, you know, there's, there's more at work in cross-domain deterrence that can lend some credibility to that sort of explanation. But again, what behavior in cyberspace are you looking to deter? If it's an attack that's going to lead to someone's death, sure, I think we can say deterrence has a role to play. Uh, if we're talking lower level things that resemble criminal activity, there's deterrence isn't going to do the heavy lifting, right? The question for me is, is right now, what explains more of the variation in Russian behavior or the lack of Russian behavior? Uh, deterrence doesn't really give us the best explanation. I really think you know, it's an element of cost. Uh, in terms of where's the benefit in doing that as, you know, everything you just listed off, Max, there's no benefit in Russia, you know, expending more resources to attack the West and, you know, draw the U.S. and or other NATO states in to a conflict that they're already struggling on the ground with, uh, you know, and as a corollary to that, there's only so much attention that your, you know, military and intelligence cyber forces you know, there's only so many issues and so many uh, places you can put personnel's attention. And right now, things in Ukraine, you know, up to now have not been going the way that they had hoped. Uh, so that's where most of the attention is being drawn uh, in the cyber domain as well. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, in the background, I think there's still an issue of specialization, right? Uh, and much of the Russian ecosystem uh, specializes in long-term exploitation, espionage, you know, in sort of low level compromises that build up over time uh, and, you know, these cumulative costs that I know you've worked on as well, Max, with uh, Richard Harknett, uh, these cumulative costs over time, that's where that's where their emphasis is. So, you know, I wouldn't expect a big bang cyber attack to happen or, you know, as you know, uh, or cyber Armageddon, uh, I think is a phrase that's been used sometimes, too. Uh, I wouldn't expect to see that. Right. Much of the retaliation I would expect from Russia is stuff that resembles criminal activity that's, you know, death by a thousand cyber cuts, if you will. Uh, so, you know, those, in terms of deterrence playing a role, I'm on the skeptical side. I think these are better reasons why we haven't seen sort of expansion of the conflict in cyberspace. 
Uh, let me both ask you one one question, uh, one last question about Ukraine before before I try to summarize some of the other questions that I've been getting uh, from the audience. So now we are um, over 100 days into this war in Ukraine and lots of uh, surprises as with any uh, armed conflict. And, um, you know, we usually operate under a so-called fog of peace before the outbreak of, of most, you know, armed hostilities. And, and, and it's really um, usually that a lot of stuff that us analysts really get wrong about the armed forces of a particular country or even the character of, of warfare um, in a particular year and a particular setting and so forth. But has there been anything you look back, um, you know, going back to your research and also, you know, to what you put into your book, Max, um, which I assume was largely finished before the outbreak of the war, right? Um, the same goes also for, for you know, a large chunk of the paper that you wrote uh, with Greg, Chase. And has there been anything really in terms of your arguments about maturity and cyber forces that have really uh, changed your mind? I mean, has there been anything happening in Ukraine or any lessons that you've picked up, anything particularly that struck you uh, that has impacted your, your thinking or perhaps made you reassess uh, some of your arguments or conclusions uh, in your respective work? Maybe you go uh, first with Max. I'll go first. Sorry, I, I lost you for a second. I'll go first, right? Um, so yes and no, and I'll give you one. So at the very end of my substantive chapters and books, I talk about the role of non-state actors. And all this discussion that I have in the book is not as important if a state, particularly what I would call a constrained state, right? So most Western governments can basically outsource their activity to a proxy mercenary or other group uh, intermediary that is out there. And there is a literature on this already. And when I, uh, when I wrote it, I, I basically said, yes, you know, um, while some people have talked about this, ultimately this is not viable for the constrained actors. And the key reason is because they will lose control over both the form and often also outcome of an operation. And when do we see this most often where intermediaries don't actually do what the principal, in this case, the state wants, is when there are great information asymmetries. And there are numerous ones uh, when it comes to cyber operations. Information symmetries about the risks being taken, how operations playing out, the chances of causing collateral damage, lots of risk uh, uh, information asymmetries. And it's also really hard to kind of control those actors and punish them in case they don't operate in the way you want them to. Then of course, Ukraine happened and you see the all the initial reports uh, around the UK uh, or Ukrainian IT army. And you're like, and I was like, whoa, I didn't expect that, that they would really, not just for defensive reasons, but also for offensive purposes, would call out a call on a much wider community to help them conduct cyber operations and potentially cyber effect operations. And now, um, increasingly, I'm starting to realize, oh, but this is a really interesting entity that simply people haven't really studied yet. And it shows perhaps some opportunities, but actually also a lot of constraints. Because once we really start to look into the Ukrainian IT army, what we see is a really small group. And I'm talking here about a dozen or so of government uh, employees that are trying to do more advanced operations and so far seem to have failed. And then this kind of layer cake of different um, non-government actors, either in Ukraine or outside, that try and um, help this cause. And the outer layer of this is simply people who have signed up to a telegram or signal channel. And uh, you then have reports who say basically anyone who has signed up to the signal or, or, or um, um, telegram channel is supposedly a hacker. And so you get these reports, 400,000 people have joined the Ukrainian IT army. But what you see is actually a fascinating relationship with the small core group that actually doesn't wanna lose control that is also afraid of like, you know, just in the name of the Ukrainian IT army, some people going out and maybe hitting critical infrastructure in Russia and causing effects that they don't want to achieve. And so what is this group then doing? Well, ultimately it's just signing up to one big botnet that is trying to cause disruptions 
um, and trying to you know still fit them in this mold. Yes, use the crowd, but also put them into a kind of structure that you allows them to use it and keep control over it. And so it's, I would have loved to, I don't know if I, I, ultimately actually now increasingly as I'm starting to look into it, I, I, yeah, perhaps it doesn't refute certainly what I wrote before, but I would have loved to use it as a case study in my book to really spell out this relationship of how even as an actor like Ukraine in, uh, with its, with its, wall, uh, with its uh, back against the wall is trying to, uh, is trying to engage with non-state actors and is in on the one hand trying to use them effectively, but is also struggling to do so. Yeah, on my end, uh, two things that I'll just briefly touch on. Uh, one thing that didn't surprise me uh, is conventional kinetic effects rule the day, right? They're gonna they're going to be more important than anything you can do in cyberspace. Uh, cyber capabilities are great; they can do a lot of things, but you know, as we've seen, a lot of the most impactful outages have actually come from destroying fiber optic cables, uh, you know, from shelling. So that's, you know, that's one thing that didn't surprise me that I think, you know, particularly in those of us that work in this space, uh, we need to always have in the back of our mind. Uh, and the second, the thing that I think I overestimated was uh, the Russian ability to integrate effects together. Uh, I was, uh, you know, I was, wasn't necessarily caught aback, but I was, I was pretty surprised that, uh, you know, the the effects that they were looking to achieve weren't achieved, and the, you know the the Viasat hack that they had. I think there there was uh, you know greater out, outages uh, in Western Europe than there were in Ukraine from that. But the, I'm surprised at how low the payoff was at that. Uh, I really thought that the Russians would be uh, further along in terms of how they could integrate their effects and how they could switch the flip from exploitation to disruption, destruction, degradation. Uh, and I think my takeaway from that is, you know, in the vein of the, the title of this panel, uh, maturity is way slower to develop than I anticipated when Greg and I wrote the paper. So it really just drove the home that this is a slow process, even for top tier militaries that we, you know, would assume have top tier capabilities in cyberspace. Uh, it's really slow process. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Max. Uh, let's now move on to some of the questions. And uh, I think that I can group them into a couple of different categories. There's one category here that I can broadly call, again, um, people or really just um, human resources and, and cyber maturity, essentially. And there's been uh, 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 one question or like a couple of questions that I think I can combine into one question, and that is, uh, Essentially, how do we really uh, make sure that the right people uh, get attracted, um, you know, into the force? Um, I think you briefly touched upon it, Max, in your introductory remarks when you said that it, it's extremely difficult for to retain some of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, human resources, uh, so to speak, when when it comes to a cyber command and you know the role cyber command plays in in war and um, the constraints uh, that cyber command uh, you know, is suffering in peacetime in terms of also, um, you know, how can you, how can you really make sure that these people are not really moving into the private sector where they could probably make more money and also uh, probably their job would be more interesting to a certain degree um, um, for, for, for them and would probably maybe gain wider, wider operational experience. So that's, I think, uh, one question. And there's, there's another more specific question um, about the role of reserves um, and cyber maturity. How, how, what, what can we really say about that? Um, you know, is it, is, it, is it a good thing maybe to come up with a cyber militia? Um, there's a question about the Swiss, the Swiss system um, also in, in the chat box. And um, um, given the fact that it's it's fairly expensive um, and that these uh, cyber fighters are really of high market value. Um, what's the best way here to, to combine essentially the, the need for cyber skills and then the number of people we, we, we can really train, for example, in, a, in the reserves um, each year on cyber skills. And then the last question um, in that regard would be really about um, um, military, like the, the the role of military uh, commanders to 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 a certain degree um and what 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 role really military commanders can really play 
in in shaping cyber maturity, which again I think goes back slightly slightly to what Jason you said in your introductory uh, remarks about the need for champions and so forth. So these are really the three broad questions when it comes to people that I've uh, tried to combine here from all the questions that I've got, and and I would love to hear your thoughts from uh, on these questions from both of you. Um, who wants to go first? Maybe Max again. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple of thoughts. Um, first is of how they get attracted, right? And um, who to draw in. First goes back to a point that I already made. That's contextualizing how many cyber commands are established and also their relationship with often the general armed forces. And here is a lesson learned of what not to do. What you see is, um, so a case of, uh, for instance, the Dutch uh, Defense Cyber Command that I've looked into in more detail is, um, the Cyber Command was established at a time of austerity with budget cuts and particularly taking place in the, uh, in the, uh, yeah, in, in the armed forces. And as a result that they said, right, for Cyber Command, we don't wanna hire any new talent. We try to attract, uh, attract IT talent across the different organizations that already exist. And it sounds like a very logical thing to do because of course um, you don't wanna fire um, those people. But what it does is you take that IT talent out of your other organizations, put them in a cyber command, a cyber command that at the time and perhaps still today doesn't have a very clear mission, again, not in peacetime at least, with no clear training and strategic setup and that then provides the perfect recruitment platform for private sector companies to go to. And so you've almost used it as a channel to see best of your, some of your best IT talent uh, leaving. And then, okay, what are then the ways in which you wanna fill this up? Well, across indeed a number of different countries, we have seen indeed the usage of reserve forces. Now, there is a role to be played for reserve forces. But that's mostly on the defensive side, mostly on the forensics side of things. On the offensive side, I don't believe it really works. And why is that the case? Well, that's because of the fundamental nature of cyber operations, where the key rule for successful cyber operations is knowing your net or knowing your target network better than the target knows uh, themselves. And once you have that, you often don't even need fancy tools to get in. But that's the key. Now, if that is the case, that often requires a really enormous amount of uh, time and potentially also resources to familiarize yourself with the target environment as to what you want and don't want to achieve. The danger with the reserve forces is to have this almost plug and play solution that doesn't really work. You can't bring them in, you know, at the time when uh, perhaps through a parliamentary um, uh, mandate, um, the organization is allowed to conduct a fact operation and say, hey, now we draw, out, draw on the private sector. Um, so again, it's mostly on the defensive side and much less on the offensive side. There are other issues that you frequently see coming up, such as the screening of reserve forces that uh, particularly in like a, a short time period uh, can be really problematic. Um, the third element here is just really recognizing, to be honest, and particularly in continental Europe, I would say, the limits of current practices. Yes, we can talk about military cyber exercise and also the public ones, for instance, you know, the ones that CCDCE organize around lock shields, cross swords, but we should also recognize that they are absolutely in no way a substitute for actual operational practice, that two, three, day events, in fact, to be, you know, don't even allow you to develop certainly no technical skills at most, they will help you a little bit in the communication skills and they have some other value, but it this no means provides this gap. And so the key there is to perhaps not just invest more in exercise, but above all in, uh, in training uh, facilities and capacities. Something that we have seen in the US with a billion dollar cyber range of US um, uh, cyber army I mean, the numbers in Europe are in the, in, the, in, the, in the small millions. You create absolutely no environment for training that truly resembles actual operational practice. And so, you know, if that is then the key thing for them to do and use and, and, and train on uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, 
that's where much of the investments will have to um, come into. Um, and this is also just to finish here, the area where I am, uh, I've written on this already previously, and it's also in my book. In my book, I explain the limits of um, particularly arms transfer across states in this space. There are very few uh, opportunities and, and uh, above all incentives to transfer, particularly your exploits and tooling to other militaries. And that's because of their transitory nature. Uh, once you've used them, it reduces the likelihood and ability for other actors to potentially use it as well. However, if there is an area for more collaboration, it would be on primarily the training setup um, here. This is where you can get much more burden sharing that um, uh, is currently not sufficiently taking place. I'll add just uh, three quick points here. Uh, since Max, I, I'm particular with what you said about retention and reserves. I'm 100% in line with that. I think you know an extra layer of uh, retention issues for personnel, uh, not just recruiting them into the system, but keeping existing expertise in a specific cyber force. Uh, an extra layer when you have like a joint combatant command model like the U.S. Uh, it, you know, U.S. Cyber Command is you have that personnel that's may be there, but they're rotational. They rotate in and out of the combatant command. Uh, so, you know, even if you can meet the standards uh, that you need uh, to actually recruit and retain talent from society, uh, even within the military, you know, body itself, uh, there are still retention problems in terms of expertise and handing over to the next uh, the next group that rotates in out of your specific service, et cetera. Uh, so that's an extra layer that you know, has to be considered, at least in some context, that, that don't use a service or a branch approach, but use a joint combatant command approach. Uh, in terms of res the reserves, uh, you know, an additional hurdle in the first place is the, the legal barriers to actually activating them. You know, I, I agree with you, Max, that, uh, you know, they, they play a defensive role, uh, first and foremost, and in some cases, it can actually be a crutch for you know, active military capability development in this space, even if it's for network defense. Uh, you know, if you rely too much on reserves, you're not developing that, you know, the active duty capability, which in and of itself for a lot of democracies, there's different constitutional uh, authorities that uh, different legal authorities that active duty versus reserves operate on uh, and different budgeting processes, et cetera. So these are all you know, considerations that go with reserves. Uh, in terms of the role of commanders, uh, you know, obviously having a commander with vision is important. Uh, you know, if you don't have a commander with a vision for how they want to harness and utilize and advocate for cyber capabilities, uh, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. But I think one thing that I haven't really hit on, uh, and it's not addressed too much in the paper that Greg and I wrote, um, but the, the role of commanders in understanding bias that they may have in terms of prioritizing equities, right? And uh, what I mean here is, do, does the commander have a proclivity to, uh, you know, prioritize intelligence collection in cyberspace uh, towards military ends? Or do they have a greater proclivity for, you know, their exploitation is ultimately in service of disruption, degradation, denying, you know, you know the D4 effects that uh, we all like to talk about. Uh, so I think, you know, in, in the US case, Admiral Mike Rogers, who was commander of Cyber Command, director of the NSA prior to Nakasone, uh, arguably had a proclivity for intelligence uh, over much more of the disruption equities. Uh, and so, you know, the question is, when you change commanders, how does that proclivity and bias for different equities change? And how does that redirect and or stymie uh, initiatives and in, uh, efforts towards greater maturity within military forces. So I think that's one thing that, uh, you know, an additional role of commanders uh, is the role of bias and priority. Just one point here, Franz, on the last mm -hmm. one. Sure. I think it's indeed fascinating to understand leaders' proclivity, but of course the US Cyber Command, and, and given its dual had a position with the NSA, has put itself in a position that Nakasone can think about these equities along those two lines. And that's not something that you see in many other countries. Right. And the countries, you know, that you have seen to some degree that end with, for example, the UK's National Cyber Force, it's, it's a little bit more of a, you know, it's not a dual hatted relationship. It's more of a fluid, uh, you know, borrowing and integrated framework. Uh, but 
you know, I think that the move that you're starting to see is, you know, at least for those, you know, upper echelon states, Max, that you talked about that are actually out there conducting offensive operations and getting that muscle memory, uh, that's the organizational move you're starting to see is, okay, how do we grapple with, you know, not only internally our intelligence and disruption equity, but also the other folks in the government that are trying to do the same thing, but towards different organizational ends. Uh, you know, uh, that's, you know, not everyone's moving towards a dual hat, but you are seeing that conversation pushed forward more explicitly. Um, thank you both. Uh, since we both talked about the United States now, uh, let's perhaps uh, get in a question about what's usually considered to be the biggest competitor, uh, potential adversary of the United States in cyberspace that is that is China. And there's uh, one, one question that I think also feeds into our question uh, our uh, discussion just now about um, human uh, capacity and human resources and so forth. Um, there's a there's a question that I find interesting also in terms of cyber maturity. Do you think uh, um, a country like China, with its um, ICT um, base as it is, do you think it will continue to require uh, foreign talent essentially in order to become um, a top top cyber? military power or what do you see the role of china in all of this and also um, i know that both of you looked at it uh, at china for for you know your individual maturity research so i would be interested in getting your thoughts on that jason you want to hand it off first yeah sure uh, i'll take a quick stab at this uh, it's it's interesting, and I think I would actually draw a distinction between foreign talent and foreign technologies and practices, uh, and the on the development side, sort of the, the research and development side. You know, China since 2016, I think, is standing up their strategic support force. Uh, they've done a lot a to centralize and draw in extra talent in that space. Now, whether that talent uh, you know executes in the way that uh the pla wants them to you know we don't really have much of a clue and i don't think they do either right there we haven't really you know their their networks and extending their networks into you know battlefield it's the same issue that their overall military has is you know how will they actually perform when you know everything hits the pavement uh we we don't really know it's been a while since the pla has been in an active conflict uh, so that's one issue. The, in terms, so I don't think it's really an issue of talent that they're relying on. I think it's an issue of can they ultimately and indigenously start to produce, you know, their own technological bases without having to rely on, you know, uh, intellectual property theft. Uh, can they actually develop their own best practices that aren't anchored in Western practices? That, you know, I think these are the conversations. And based on what Greg and I have investigated, and Greg has done a lot more work into. Uh, you know, the PLA initiatives than I have, I, I don't think they're there yet, right? And there's there's a trade-off with relying on sort of Western infrastructure, Western technology, is it can get you a lot of the way there, but it won't get you over the hump to actually be able to, you know, in-house produce your own tools, capabilities uh, that, you know, can exploit others' networks that are, aren't based on exploits that are already out there in the wild somehow. I think China is really a fascinating actor for a number of different reasons. One that stands out in relation to my book is that you may call China the most peaceful cyber power out there. Uh, and what do I mean with that um, is that we can think about so many espionage operations that China has conducted, and they can certainly have had, as I've argued myself, cumulatively real strategic effects. But good luck trying to think about really effect operations that China has conducted. Um, I can think of perhaps only one, maybe two, which is a DDoS attack against GitHub, but not really the kind of white use of wipers, not even, I haven't seen any threat into report on that, them doing this in, you know, uh, in Taiwan or somewhere else. Uh, we have certainly not seen them doing any critical infrastructure attacks, none of it. So whilst we have seen so much espionage activity, we have seen no effect operations from China. And that, of course, leads to a wide range of questions as to why this is the case. And one of the ones that I've argued before, yeah, you know that 
you know, the espionage operations are strategically meaningful, harder to, to act against. But the other, and that seems to come out, I, I, I'm, I'm editing in actually another book with, an, uh, with one of the chapters from a former uh, PLA colonel who argues what we're seeing now is a slight shift in thinking in China and a change in understanding about the role of, of, of cyber war and how um, uh, China should, should integrate that. Perhaps it will change in the future. Um, but that's really an open question. And so I'm also very cautious of making any claims about Chinese ability to indeed integrate potential cyber effects operations in case of war with their conventional forces because we have so little to draw on. But one other observation, and that's what we have seen particularly this year. What we have seen this year is an enormous spike in the use of what we call zero day exploits used by Chinese actors. And what I actually discuss in the book and within this PTO framework, people, exploits, tools, infrastructure, and organization, when I talk about exploits is that too often we talk about these zero days and that countries stockpile them and use them. Too often we pay way too much emphasis on it. But because, because of an earlier comment I made, it's mostly about understanding the target network of your adversary and often you can get in without the use of exploits at all if you're using them but they are an indicator of sophistication. And the way that we have seen them using them in the last year and the ability to you know, quickly turn a vulnerability into an exploit and deploy it is incredible. And the willingness to just seemingly to burn them, which is normally such an inefficient use of resources against target that seems, targets that don't seem to be that valuable to them, you know, seems to either suggest a real immaturity because like, no Western state would use like highly valuable zero days for certain like really unimportant targets. But at the same time, perhaps it shows a degree of maturity as well, because if you don't have a scarcity supposedly anymore, then why not throw them at it? Because you feel you can regenerate them enormously. And really, this is a concern that I'm sure many intelligence agencies have. And this is one that you know, requires further study in, uh, in the years ahead, and we'll have to follow very closely as to how this will change um, in, uh, yeah, in the coming years. Yeah, and to your point, Max, uh, about you know, developing sophistication for the PLA, uh, one thing that that reminds me of is if you look at, you know, obviously the, a lot of the strategy has focused on, yes, espionage, intellectual property theft, controlling information in cyberspace, uh, but you, you, in addition to you know the zero day exploit issue, you start to see a little bit more uh, experimentation and almost recklessness to try and uh, to a degree gain you know gain some of that muscle memory. And, and I'm thinking in particular about the Microsoft Exchange hack, right? Uh, you know, once it's discovered, they start just hacking everything in sight uh, and leaving a lot of you know potential collateral damage, collateral opportunity uh, on the table. Uh, and like, you know, part of me thinks that, you know, it's such a widespread compromise, you know, even though it was relatively sloppily done to the point where if someone were to come in behind them, there's a whole lot of damage that could have been wrecked uh, across a number of systems and networks because they just left the door open. Uh, but that, that to me shows that there is this move towards greater sophistication in the, in the types of targets that they're trying to get into as well. Yeah, I think it's, it's a good observation on types of target. And, and I, perhaps it might be part of a broader trend, right? What Snowden leaks have uh, shown already a long time ago is that, you know, particularly the five eyes are keen to go um, to uh, those targets that then later on give them wide access to a whole range of other targets, whether these are cloud providers or whether this is telecoms or whether this is, um, you know, uh, uh, supposedly GCHQ drawing up a list of all the system administrators in a given country. Um, you know, all of that. And clearly what we have seen with both Russia and China is this awareness like this is where we have to be. And, you know, this is where um, there are hard targets. But once we are in, there is just so much we can do and so much access that we can leverage after that it's totally worth the effort. Thank you both uh, for your insights on this uh, subject. Um, so we have about four minutes left. Um, I'll give each of you two minutes uh, for any last uh, comments that you would like 
to make or uh, perhaps, um, I mean, since the topic of this webinar was uh, really transformation or the transformation of cyber forces, what are the things that are you going to particular pay attention to over the next 10 years? And maybe you can really try to be as concise as possible. Uh, two minutes, uh, two minutes for, for each one of your responses, and then um, we're going to conclude the seminar. Thank you. Well, I'll, uh, I'll kick it off and give Max the last word here. Uh, I, I'm looking at two things, and they're, they're, I would say they're really more boring, uh, is, you know, how, how are ideas about how cyber capabilities fit in the bigger picture? Uh, how is that going to change moving forward, particularly given, you know, the different experiences and different lessons countries will draw from the war in Ukraine right now. And, you know, I'm, you know, piggybacking off of what we just were talking about with China, one thing I'm really interested to know, which clearly there's no way to tell right now, but the lessons that Beijing will be drawing from, you know, the efforts in cyberspace where, where the Russians have in some cases succeeded in a lot of cases where they haven't really succeeded. Uh, you know, in the next 10 years, uh, the question that, everyone in Washington here is thinking about bigger picture is, you know, could this happen? When did this happen with Taiwan? Uh, and so one of the things I'm really looking at is how does this thinking change between now and 10 years out about how we fit the puzzle of cyber capabilities into conventional capabilities? Uh, that's, that's a big thing that I'm looking at. The second is, where's the money going? And, you know, this is what to one of Max's broader points, uh, you know, you need money to get people in. You need money to build out organizations. You need money to, you know, update your software, uh, of all things. You know, where are, where are countries going to get the money from? Particularly, you know, the economic squeeze that uh, is occurring right now with arguably shrinkflation happening here in the U.S. and in Europe. Uh, where are we going to get the money to keep building out these organizations and not just have them be hollow shells, uh, you know, for the sake of standing up a cyber command for the sake of standing up a cyber command. Like, unfortunately, you have seen some of the smaller European countries as you've done research on Max. Uh, you know, so that, those are my two takeaways. Uh, you know, what's the thinking gonna look like and how can we start to prepare for that? And where's the money going? And I think my third takeaway is, Max, please tell all of us in the US here that are waiting when your book's gonna come out <laughs> in the US. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, the, on the last on the last question, I think it's kind of come out in uh, in late August or early September. So hopefully, I'll see you then in person uh, as well. Um, yeah, there are a couple of different areas that I'm looking into right now. Uh, let me just end with one in the interest of time, and that is around cyber postures. So what I've been doing in this book is say, okay, clearly we, we've seen a trend around the militarization of cyber efforts. But what I'm not going into in great depth is, you know, there's so many different ways in which you can operationalize. Uh, you can have a really small force that is only indeed operating in wartime, but even in wartime is just supporting your other military efforts. Or you can have an extreme uh, circumstances of force that in the times of war has some type of counter value capability, meaning it could disrupt critical infrastructure against your worst adversaries from which you expect an invasion um, to really increase the cost. Uh, we can all imagine which countries may want to do that and against which countries <laughs> considering recent events. But you have also cyber commands, of course, that may operate in peacetime and so on. The way in which they will operate and are set up and the type of people you need and the type of ways in which you're going to keep maintain your capability are vastly different. And that connection, you know, in the current book, I talk about constraints and capability and the relationship a little bit. But to draw this out a bit further, I think is really important because right now we almost have only two models, which is, you know, a more persistent engagement type of model of the US that now the UK is increasingly following as well, although it uses different terminology. And then a uh, almost deterrence-based model um, in, in most other uh, certainly Western countries. And there is nothing in between. There is no granularity in really understanding how to establish uh, and how to strategize around this and how this influences then your, um, yeah, again, your capability requirements. So that's for me uh, in the, also in the short term, uh, the next step uh, in my research endeavors. Well, let me thank you both for this very interesting uh, discussion. I think I learned a lot, took away a lot. Um, and of course, we could continue this conversation for some time. But uh, this was uh, mo most interesting. And uh, thank you. Thank you all for uh, tuning in.
Let me just uh, repeat one more time. The title of uh, Max's book, it's called No Shortcuts, Why States Struggle to Develop a Military Cyber Force. And it's available already in the UK and other parts of Europe and will be out, uh, according to Max, in two months in the United States. So thank you again, uh, Jason and Max, and uh, have a good uh, day, everyone else. Thank you.